Welcome to New Life. Uh, just want to welcome you and, and to explain that our worship this morning is brought to you by the uh, people from the summit in Sault Ste. Marie. And God has uh, blessed them. And so we just want you to be blessed by them. So here you have the worship team from the summit.
faithfulness. Lord, when we turn our backs on you, even when we're not faithful to you, you are still faithful to us. You are so, so good to us. And help us to appreciate your faithfulness, appreciate your love, your attention, Lord, that you would become the king of our hearts, Lord, that you would have our attention. That's our heart's desire. We want to get to know you. We want you you to take up more and more residence in our life. So come and have your way in our lives today and this week. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen.
Well, good morning and welcome to New Life Center, Santa de Nouvelle Vie in Hearst, Ontario, and uh, we're so glad you can join us. But we can see the clouds lifting, and uh, the freedoms we once had are returning, slowly but surely. And we'll keep you posted, but if an actual indoor meeting is po not possible, we'll be seriously looking at doing a, an outdoor uh, meeting, like a drive-in. And uh, so keep looking. The best connection is our Facebook page, but don't forget our web page. And uh, that is NLCNV, New Life Center, Nouvelle Vie, uh, .net. And uh, don't go to our old web page, it's basically unusable. So that's our web page. So uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day. We ask you, Lord, that you would just meet us where we are and just touch us, help us to understand your word and to grow in Jesus' name. Amen. Now this morning I want to shift gears um, and look at lives transformed. And this is why Jesus came, to transform lives, to put a new heart into people, to bring them back to life. So I've entitled my message, The Holiness of God. Whoops, back up here for a second. Whoa, really a zipped on a head, didn't it? The holiness of God or dirty rags transformed. Dirty rags transformed. Did you know that in 1842, that's less than 100 years ago, or excuse me, a little over 100 years ago, the first bathtub, first bathtub, was denounced as luxurious and a democratic vanity. <laughs> And in Boston, they made it unlawful to bathe, except on doctor's prescription. And in 1843, Philadelphia made ba bathing illegal between November 1st and March 15th. And for you of us and me that like to bathe on a regular ba basis, it wasn't allowable. And how tragic that most, Canadian, most Christians have adopted a similar schedule of spiritual cleansing. We'd rather put up with the stench of our unconfessed sins than come clean before God. Now during a tour of a large manufacturing plant, a visitor noticed a man using a, a fiery torch of high intensity to work on a huge slab of steel and operating from a blueprint, uh, the pointer traced the pattern, and then by a cl clever system, of course, going back a few years, it enlarged and designed as it was burning the metal. And there were times, however, when the flame would go out or not even make any impression at all. And when this happened, a chemical substance was applied to the resisting patch, and immediately the, the cutting could be resumed. And the worker exclaimed that although the torch was able to go through clean steel eight inches thick, if it encountered the slightest film of rust on the surface, the flame couldn't penetrate it. Now this is a picture of us as Christians. The Holy Spirit is seeking to produce in us God's perfect design. And if the life is unblemished, he's able to continue his efforts. But if we become carnal or backslidden, his work of shaping us is hindered until the area that is in question is thoroughly cleansed. By the holiness of God, we mean that he is absolutely separate from sin. And he is exalted above all his creation. And he's equally separate from all moral evil and sin. And it symbolizes, that holiness symbolizes the perfection of God in all that He is. In God, we have the purity of being, not the purity of willing. And let me illustrate this by saying that God does not will the good because it is good, but God's will is the expression of his nature, which is holy. And are, are you starting to see the need for the forgiveness of sin yet? 
No? Well, okay. In the Old Testament, this is the quality or the characteristic, the feature, the attribute that God wanted to be known for. Let's take a look at why I'm saying this. Leviticus chapter 11:44. After all, I the Lord am your God, and you must be holy because I am holy. So do not defile yourselves by touching any of these animals or scurry around the ground. And I the Lord am the one who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You must be therefore you th- must therefore be holy because I am holy. Joshua Chapter 24, verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. 1 Samuel, chapter 6, verse 20. And the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? To whom shall it go up from us? In Psalm 23, 22-3, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Then on to Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 25, To them, to whom then will you liken me? Or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Ezekiel, So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Habakkuk 1.12 Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, O Lord. You have appointed them for judgment, O Rock. You have marked them for correction. It's emphasized about Mount Sinai when God came down upon the mountain in Exodus chapter 19 verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him. But he shall be surely stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. And when the trumpet sounds long, they shall Come near the mountain. And over to Exodus 19.21. And the Lord said to Moses, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through to gaze upon the Lord, and many of them will perish. Also let the priests who come near the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai. You warned us, saying, Set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. Then the Lord said to him, Away, get down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and spoke to them. It's emphasized by the division of the tabernacle and the temple into the holy place and the most holy place. Exodus chapter 26, verse 33. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps, Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there, behind the veil. And the veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. 1 Kings chapter 6 verse 16. Then he built the 20 cubit room at the rear of the temple from floor to ceiling with cedar boards. He built it inside as the inner sanctuary as the most holy place. His holiness is shown by the prescribed offerings that had to be brought out by the Israelites to approach God in Leviticus 1, chapter 1, verse through 7. We're not going to read that, of course. By the institution of a new priesthood to mediate between the people and God, Leviticus 8, chapters 8, verse through 10. And by the... just. A whole pile of laws, many laws of impurity. Chapters 11 and 15 of uh, Leviticus. It's shown by the set feasts of Israel in Leviticus 23. And by the isolation of Israel in Palestine. Numbers 23.9. Deuteronomy 33.28. 450. 57 times the word holy is used. 
And in the New Testament, we find a similar stress on holiness. 74 times, not as a name of God, but as a request to be holy. John 17.11 Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Hebrews chapter two, verse t- excuse me, chapter twelve, verse ten. For they indeed for a few days chastened us, as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. First Peter chapter one, verse fifteen. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct, because it is written, "Be holy, for I am." Holy. Revelations chapter 4 verse 8. The four living creatures, each having wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And because of the fundamental character of this attribute, The holiness of God, rather than the love or the power or the will of God, should be given first place. Why? Well, because holiness is the principle which regulates all three of God's attributes or characteristics. His throne is established on the basis of His holiness. Psalm 48, verse 8. God reigns above the nations sitting on his holy throne. Psalms 89 verse 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. So, what should we learn this morning about the fact that God is holy? I mean, it seems so ethereal. So untouchable. And there is a chasm between God and the sinner. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. Hmm. There was a time when God could fellowship with man. But when man, in the form of Adam and Eve, sinned, he became estranged from God. And God from men. Now, that fellowship was broken. Now, loneliness is a growing problem in our society, especially at the time of COVID. In a study by the, uh, believe it or not, American Council of Life Insurance reported that the most Lonely group in America was college students, and that's surprising. But next on the list are divorced people, welfare recipients, single mothers, rural students, housewives, and the elderly. And today, basically, you can put everybody in that bucket. And to point out how lonely people are, Charles Swindles mentioned an ad in a Kansas newspaper. Now listen, it read this. I will listen to you talk for 30 minutes without comment. For five dollars. This window says sounds like a hoax, doesn't it? But the person was serious. And did anyone call? You bet. It wasn't long before this individual was receiving ten to twenty calls a day. And the pain of loneliness was so sharp that some are willing to try anything for half an hour of companionship. We have an age of the internet where people are trying and telling everything about themselves, having anybody listen, and we wonder why our students have issues when people turn against them, especially their own peers, and they use that internet to destroy them with words. And they become lonely because the only way they have to communicate has been shut down. And you know what? The bar is probably the best counterfeit of the church. There is to the fellowship that Christ wants to give his church. A 
a counterfeit. And the bar is an imitation. It dispenses liquor instead of grace. Escape rather than reality. But it is the permissive. It is the accepting. It is an inclusive fellowship. It's unshockable. It's democratic. The problem is that people come to church and they become judged. So rather than being the hospital that we are to be, the place of welcome and of bringing people into Christ, we become a place of judgment and of disconnection that people will seek out other places to find fellowship. Now you can tell people secrets and they usually don't tell others or even want to. But that bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put into the human heart the desire to know, to be known, to be loved, and to love. And so many people seek out this counterfeit for the price of a few beers. Now the second thing that we must learn, sorry, here we go again. The second thing we must learn about God's holiness is that one man must approach God through the merits of another. You can't do it on your own. You ain't got it. You don't have it in you. And man neither possesses nor can acquire that sinless, sinlessness that is necessary to access God. But Christ has come and made access possible. Now Romans chapter 5 verse 2, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The glory. By faith. Because of what Christ did. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. And then in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19. Therefore brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us. Through the veil, that is his flesh. And when he died, the veil in the temple in Israel was torn from the top to the bottom. It was a very tall, very tall curtain, very thick. And yet God took it down and said, no more. There's no more difference now. You can come through the sacrifice that Jesus made. Because of what he did, we can come through to God now. Because you see, in God's holiness lies the reason we need an atonement or a sacrifice or a compensation. And so what was his holiness, excuse me, what his holiness uh, demanded, his love provided. What his holiness demanded, his love provided. Provided when C.H. Spurgeon, great orator of God uh, from England, was under conviction of the Holy Spirit, he had a clear sense of the justice of God, and sin became an intolerable burden. He didn't feel, or excuse me, he didn't fear hell as much as he despised the reality of his own wrongdoing. And he said, All the while I had upon my mind, a deep concern for the honor of God's name and the integrity of his moral government. I felt that it would not quiet my conscience if I could be forgiven without justice being satisfied. But then came the question, how can God be just and yet justify me from all my guilt? But Spurgeon finally came to realize that Jesus was a substitute. He atoned for us as a substitute, because he was the only one that could. 
Spurgeon says, I believe that the doctrine of Jesus paying for my sins is one of the surest proofs of the inspiration of Scripture. For who would? Or who could have thought of the just ruler dying for the unjust rebel? That's you and I. Because we are rebellious. It's our nature to be rebellious. Coming all the way back from Adam and Eve. But thirdly, we should learn that we must approach God with a reverence and godly fear. A right view of God's holiness leads to the right view of sin. Job chapter 40 verse 3, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer yes twice, and I will proceed no further. Wow. Wow. Job got it real quick. He was a guy that had had everything. He lost everything. He would be in today's society a billionaire. And he lost everything, including his health. His children. All he had left was him and his wife. And she, even she said, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? Job stuck to his guns and served God. But he realized that if it wasn't for God's grace, that he had nothing. Isaiah 6, 5. So I said, woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken from the t with the tongs, from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your nicotine is taken away, and your sin purged. Humiliation, contrition, and confession flow from a scriptural view of the holiness of God. One day, a uh, young minister was being escorted through a coal mine. I've been through the uh, iron mines down near Wawa, or in Wawa, and uh, I can kind of identify with this a bit. But at the entrance of one of the dim passageways, he spied a beautiful white flower growing out of the black earth. And he had to ask the question, how can it blossom in such purity and radiance in this filthy, dirty mine? The preacher asked, how can that be? And the person that was with him, the guide said, throw some coal dust on it and see for yourself. And when he did, he was surprised at the fine sooty particles of the coal slid right off the snowy petals, leaving the plant just as lovely and unstained as it was before. Its surface was so smooth that the grit and grime couldn't adhere to it. Today we would call it a Teflon plant. Our hearts should have that characteristic. Just as the flower couldn't control its habitat, it was in the mind, just as we are in the world. So we can't help if we live in a world filled with evil, but God's grace can keep us so clean and unspotted, and though we touch every side, it will not cling to us. If we want the Lord's full blessing and approval, we must pay attention to this warning in 1 Timothy 5.22. Keep yourself pure. I like the message's uh, interpretation of this. Keep a close check on yourself. By the cleansing power of His Word and the sanctifying influence of His Holy Spirit, it's possible for the Christian to remain clean in a dirty place. <laughs> in England, there's a uh, paper factory that makes the finest stationery. And one day a man was touring the factory and asked what, was, what it was made from, and he was shown a whole huge pile of old rags. 
And the rag content is what determined the quality of the paper. But the man wouldn't believe it. So, a few weeks later, he received a package of paper with the company, had him embossed his initials on it. And on the first page were written these letters. Dirty rags transformed. Dirty rags transformed. That's how we started this morning. God's holiness or dirty rags transformed. We're the dirty rags and God transforms us into beautiful paper so that he can write his love on those sheets. So people can read from our lives the beauty and the transformation power of a holy God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning that you love us, you keep us, you protect us. So Lord God, I ask you right now that you will make us into the kind of people that we need to be. May we be dirty rags transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You have a fantastic week in the Lord.